<clears throat> My investigation is focused on the two astrological almanacs by Francisco Guilherme Casmas, a, a Portuguese. Uh, sorry, um, this is this is uh, some topics that I'm going to to mention during the presentation. Um, so uh, I was uh, as I was saying. I've, I'm focusing on two astrological almanacs by Francisco Guilherme Casmas, a Portuguese surgeon and astrologer who served in the courts of King Philip II, King Philip III, and King João IV. Casmas was born on 4th of October of 1569 in Lisbon, Portugal, and he studied at a Jesuit college, most likely Saint Vincent, as well as in Paris and Salamanca, where he graduated in medicine. Kajmash's prognostics for the years 16, 1645 and 1646 stood out in the Portuguese popular astro astrological panorama of the, sorry, of the 17th century for their richness of content, for their length, but above all, for being the only productions from this period to include the horoscope for the entry of the sun into the sign of Aries, which is the spring equinox and the beginning of the astrological year. The type of language used in the discourse and the inclusion of Latin quotations, along with a more careful presentation and a clear investment by incorporating a horoscope and the eclipses depictions, all common characteristics in similar exemplars from other countries, have distinguished Kashmash's works among a genre that appear to be far more modest in the Portuguese context. Also noteworthy is the inclusion in Almanac Prototipo of a poem as well as a grammatical epigram, both written in Latin, on Kashmash's name, by, Diag by Diogo de Paiva de Andrade, a well-known supporter of the Restoration. Due, due to the obvious costs associated with these publications, their price was therefore far superior, and so all these features have led scholars to consider that Kashmash's aim was to write for a wealthier and more illustrated audience. However, rather than aiming at a different public, I argued, I argued that Kashmash, as he himself said, wanted his work to be, a, to be a model for other authors who would pursue their own writings in the field. His efforts to replicate a more proper production, both in terms of structure, content, and, math and mathematical accuracy, as well as in authority-based judgments, reveal the author's attempt to, to elevate the genre, and consequently, the discourse, the discourse put together to advocate for the new king. Written in 1644 and 1646, Kajmash's almanacs comprise astrological practices aimed at the public and are of particular importance due to their publication in the post-restoration period, as well as for their intense political discourse at a time when the legitimacy of the new regime was being strongly contested. The war, the war with the Spanish crown since Portugal's self-proclamation of independence in 1640 and the revolts in Portugal, which were a reflection of a general discontent of the people, contributed to the increase in stability in the territory, felt since the death of King Sebastião in 1578. The crisis of succession that followed, alongside the economic difficulties resulting namely from the rescue of, of soldiers imprisoned in Morocco following the Battle of Alcácer Quivir and the invasion of Brazil at the time a Portuguese colony by Holland, led the nobility and the prelate to support the Spanish candidate to the throne, Philip II of Spain, who was wealth and controlled several European territories instead of Catherine of Braganza. Sixty years of Spanish rule followed, during which the discontent of the Portuguese people, especially the upper classes, grew. Contrary to their expectations, the Philippine dominion did not meet, meet all their requirements and they soon began to feel the consequences of its control. João of Braganza was then strongly encouraged by the nobles to lead the revolt of 1640 and to claim power. At this time of political and social uncertainty, in which astrology was intrinsically embedded in society, astrologers used popular productions such as almanacs, repertorios, lunarios, and prognostics, among others, to convey practical information related to everyday life, such as the weather, how it would affect crops and harvesting, as well as the health of the population. In more complex productions, but also depending on the author, economic, social, and political issues could be incorporated, along with news about the war, navigation efforts, and territories overseas. 
However, these publications also served as an attempt to give credibility to the regime in place and to astrology as a functional practice. At a time when the astronom astronomical observations made by Tycho Brahe and the Galileo Galilei, among others, gave rise to a debate that resulted in a, in a change in theories and beliefs about the influence of celestial bodies and subsequently the decline of the Aristotelian cosmos. In addition, the prohibitions imposed by the Inquisition and the strong repression of the discipline resulting from Pico de la Miranda's attacks in 1496 had a strong impact in astrology. One can see practitioners constantly justifying their judgments and confirming their conformity with the rules dictated by the Catholic Church. In the context of the history of, the, of science, these works are set in the early modern period, a period in which the concept of science started to change and in which practices that did not seek to, to show the causes of phenomena, dubbed occult sciences, were discredited and excluded from the academic field. So, while relevant scientific matters were being developed and made known to the public, astrology, due to a very complex and, and, net, and yet not fully understood process, came to lose its place among the respected sciences. In Portugal, faced with this paradigm shift, the subject, which until then had been included in important educational institutions, namely the medicine, medicine curriculum at the University of Coimbra and at Ala da Esfera at the College of Santo Antão in Lisbon, came to be increasingly criticized outside intellectual circles and progressively associated with superstitious beliefs. However, contrary to the general belief, widely spread by the dominant histori historiography until the 20th century, astrological practices remained active in certain contexts. Recent studies by Luis Ribeiro and Henri Clayton have shown how in the 17th and 18th centuries, astrology was taught and profoundly debated within Jesuit, Jesuit colleges, long after the limits imposed by the Catholic Church. In popular works, following a Following a period of widespread dissemination of prognostics, which contributed to the trivialization and simplification of their content, the authors were the target of much criticism and gradually lost their place within a genre that was beginning to lose its astrological content. Together with imitations intended to ridicule this discipline and the shift in the focus of these publications, increasingly devoted to a different notion of scientific matters, they all contributed to the mar marginalization of astrology. Nonetheless, at the height of these scientific de developments, astrologers were still writing on the influence of the celestial sphere on the terrestrial one, under Aristotelian natural philosophy, ignoring the ideas advocated about the new cosmological model. Several were the writings on the restoration, it, and it is considered that the discourse in favor of the Braganza dynasty, led, a, led above all by the intellectual elites, was extremely important in unifying public opinion and establishing the new regime that took power after independence from Spain. However, Kazmash went a step further by correlating the King's Bird Chart and other celestial events to demonstrate João of Braganza's predestination to the Portuguese throne. While transmitting prognostics with useful, useful information on practical matters, he used this place of speech to publicly support the new regime, casting judgments on political matters that came dangerously close to the prohibitions issued by the Inquisition. <coughs> These works have been addressed in the field of the history of science by Luis Miguel Carlin and Karl Ziller Kamenetsky, who have referred to Kazmash's dispute with Manuel Gomes Galhan Lorosa, a renowned astrologer, and the impact both may have had on society by intervening in the public opinion with a, with a discourse, discourse in support of the Braganza dynasty, but also by Carl Henrique Vollero, who in his master's dissertation focused on Kazmash's astrological argumentation in relation to pop political prognostics for that period. All these works are of great importance for, for a historical input. However, the, ten, the, the technical aspects of the two almanacs have been neglected and have so far remained unexplored. My investigation approaches these documents from an, an astrological point of view, presenting a new perspective on the author's motivations for publishing them. Based on an analysis of Kashmash's methodology and technical aspects, I aim to better understand the practices and knowledge employed in his, in his work 
and contribute to the growing research on astrological works intended for the public in a particularly tumultuous social, pol political and economic period for the country. In his first almanac, entitled Almanac Prototype, that was written in 1644, but with the prognosis for 1645, Kajmash presented the reasons that led him to publish it. In addition to wanting to elevate the genre, which he considered not to be at the level of Portuguese mathematicians, the main reason given by the author is related to the authorship of a treatise on a plague of locusts, which, according to him, had occurred on 8th October 1639 in Lisbon. Apparently, La Rosa had mentioned being the author of the manuscript in the prologue to his almanac for 1641. Years later, in the almanac for 1644, he mentioned Kazmash's name again, criticizing him for proclaiming to the world that he was the one that had written, written it and questioned his knowledge, saying, quote, I think it's insolence to steal my honor, something he unjustly says about me. I do not think he saw my paper any more than I saw his. Either my things are to be coveted, or he knows little, even if he presumes." End of quote. This type of accusation against Kajmash's knowledge uh, is constant in Lorosa's reference to the astrologer. A year after this, after this mention, Kajmash then published his first almanac in order to publicly dis defend himself against Lorosa's allegations. At the same time, he was presenting a version of an almanac that, in his view, would be more complete and worth of, worthy of publication. As a result, a public ex exchange of accusations began. At this point, the central issue, issue was no longer the authorship of the manuscript, but a general criticism of each other's practices, initiated by Kajmash's analysis and verification of Lorosa's work, which pointed out in detail his mathematical errors and flaws in judgment. It is not known whether Lorosa referred to Kajmash again in his 1645 almanac, as his work has not survived to the present day. There is, however, a lunario for the same year, but in which he says nothing about the subject. This first episode allows us to understand Kashmash's motivations for entering the almanac business, as well as the reason why the two authors kept mentioning each other in, in works in the years that followed. There is a known reference to the contact of a treatise entitled The Pretentosa Chegada a Este Reino da Praga dos Gafanhotos, which was attributed to La Rosa by Friar Manuel Homme, Homme, his contemporary. In 1642, Manuel Homme quoted a passage from the manuscript stating that La Rosa, quote, clearly insinuates and hints at the ruin of the Castilian monarchy, end of quote, by a, cer by a certain king, whom he assumes to be King João IV. However, um, sorry, I'm going to continue. As can be seen, um, a quote from Ome: "The king, our lord, will make Lisbon the head of the monarchy, where he will attend." Here, the author declares, "Well, is is quoting a passage um, apparently by Lorosa." And from there, he will depart with great army to Briberia and will make himself absolute lord of the whole of it restoring the holy city of Jerusalem to the Catholic Church with universal pledge of all Christendom. As can be seen, the prognosis announced important conquests by the hidden king, king a, cogn a cognomen of the deceased King Sebastian. According to various authors, including the astrologers in question, João de Ford will be his embodiment. Manuel Homem attributed the work to La Rosa. However, from this station alone, it is not possible to ascertain the authorship of the manuscript, which would have been distributed anon an anonymously, nor to know its true content. Since the, since the only known reference is related to the change of government, it is not known whether the prognosis that correlated the plague with the effects on the kingdom was of an astrological nature. It also remains to be seen whether more than one treatise was written on the subject something that Kajmash himself admits to be plausible, and when the plague actually occurred. Some recent works refer to May 1640, and a date given by Siner, a 17th century Spanish friar, but Omen refers 
1639, and Kajmash is even more precise, referring in his 1646 almanac to 8th of October 1639 as the day of the event. Despite the many uncertainties surrounding the judgment contained in the manuscript, or manuscripts, and the plague that, that gave rise to it, its importance, is, its importance is evident, which is understandable given the subject matter. His works seem to have predicted, or at least established, a correlation between the phenomenon and Portugal's long-awaited liberation from Spanish rule. The fact is that, regardless of, this, of its content, the manuscript certainly had an impact on the, literary, the, the, on the literary world to the point of creating discord between the two authors and making them fight for recognition of having written it. The theme, centered around the meaning and importance of the change of regime, was the main reason for the relevance attributed to it and the reason that provoked a discussion over several other works that followed. <coughs> As you can see here, the frontispiece of the two almanacs are uh, quite distinct from other almanacs from this period and uh, display the dedications um, sorry, of, of each of them. Almanac Prototipo was dedicated to, to Queen Luisa de Guzmão, wife of King João IV, who is said to have had a special interest in astrology. And Brachilogia, was dedicated to the very distinguished ancient and illustrious Lusitanian nobility. Here are the licenses request, requested by the Inquisition. And he, here in the next slides, I present the structure of both almanacs. And we can see they are quite different. In the first one, Kajmash um, put more effort and explained why he wanted to present a proper almanac for, for the future, for the future author's copy. And in the second one, he said um, he, he didn't want to extend himself so much. And uh, he is mostly answering to, um, to Lorosa criticism and uh, also rectifying some things of his previous almanac and are saying, what he um, uh, predicted and happened, but he didn't want to, to make uh, such a um, length, sorry, uh, a, a big work as the previous one. So in both almanacs, in addition to the basic information of, about the mov movable feasts and the four tempora, the ember days of the year, each one contains a judgment made for each lunation and for the sun's entry into the four cardinal signs, that is, for the start of the different seasons. They also include the foreseen effects for the eclipses visible in Portugal and, as expected because of the context at the time, pol political, political considerations as well. Uh, when, when analyzing these almanacs and comparing them with almanacs by other authors, we see that Kajmash's are more complete and comprehensive. Kajmash's work is considerably more thorough, presenting more detailed judgments that are always backed up with quotes from reference authors or mentioning is their works that support the, the tradition. <coughs> However, despite the fact that they are more thoughtful works, I, don't, I do not consider there are any grounds to justify the accusations that Kajmash intended to address a more literate audience, since many, since many other works contain some of the same elements, particularly the Latin quotations. Kajmash's work stands out especially for its layout and for the fact that it presents the horoscopes of the sun's entry into Aries for Lisbon, which is understandable given that he wanted to include in his works the basic component for a minimal, minimally well-structured work. <coughs> in Amanac Prototipo, Kajmash dedicated a large part of the prologue to denouncing Lorosa for his mathematical imprecisions and errors of judgment in Almanacs from previous years as well as his misconduct in regard to the appropriation of other authors' works. Considering his fanciful works were damaging the reputation of the Portuguese astrological corpus, 
The author therefore intended to show that the mistakes Lorosa was making as the result of a careless work were not representative of the generalized efforts carried out in the country. So, despite not accusing him of intentionally deceiving his readers, but rather attributing his failures to ignorance, Kajmash openly said having felt compelled to denounce him in order not to be complicit in his practices by allowing him to keep committing such mistakes. Thus, in his opinion, by pointing out the errors, Kajmash will be giving Lorosa the opportunity to rectify his situation after the first almanacs, or if he did not, it will serve, it will serve as a warning to the readers. Although he was referring more specifically to Lorosa's works, his reference to Ferrein's contempt for the prognostications published in Portugal suggests that it, this was not an isolated case. Therefore, criticizing the productions aimed at the public in general, which he considered did not do justice to the level of mathematics in the country, Kajmash justified the production of his own almanac as a way of presenting an exemplary publication with the structure that such a work should obey and thus contribute to rehabilitate the genre. It is important to note that having studied at a, at a Jesuit college, Kajmash would have had contact with the intellects of high level. What he condemned in his, in his criticism were popular works that were the productions whose authors had, had studied astrology many times independently. Delving into Lorosa's 1644, 1644 almanac, Kajmash proceeded to explain in detail some of the mistakes made by the astrologer, claiming that for, quote, being already the eighth year, end of quote, that he said to be engaged in studying astrology, had an obligation to show the progresses he had made in it. The main error pointed out by the author was that Lorosa was unable to calculate the entry of the sun into the sign of Harris for the Lisbon meridian. Actually, he said he had never gotten it right. According to Kajmash, in other words of his, Lorosa had also committed the same mistake, deliberating on horoscopes for different meridians or than, other than Lisbon. Um, other, sorry, uh, for the 1642 almanac, Lorosa would have had would have presented the sun's entry into Harris as occurring 12 hours earlier than the time pointed out by Ergoli and Ariganos. When adjusting the horoscopes for Lisbon, the time is not in accordance with the distance between the locations, be it Rome or Frankfurt, depending on whether he used Ergoli's or Ariganos' ephemerides, since the sun's entry in that city should occur just a couple of hours before. Erroneously calculating a difference of so many hours that does not seem plausible, even to an inexperienced mathematician. This leads to the consideration that he may have copied data, not realizing the adjustments he ought to make, both in relation, in relation to a different location and to the way of reading the time, as it was shown in the ephemerides. Somehow, he seemed to be unfamiliar with the standard way of referring to time. Regarding the 1643 and the 1642, for almanacs, Kajmash claimed Lorosa had calculated the charts for Frankfurt and Rome, respectively, once again, once again not properly adjusting them to the Portuguese city. Spe specifically for the 1644 almanac, it is indeed quite obvious that Lorosa merely copied the horoscope from Argolis ephemerides, since the time of both charts coincides. However, differences mentioned in the judgment reveal minor changes but which I attribute to his ineptitude in, in analyzing the charts. The, the possibility that Lorosa once again would have not realized the way of referring to time and eventually would have ended up calculating it to 12 hours apart is ruled out, since he analyzes a chart very similar to the one by Argoli. However, in relation to the previously mentioned almanacs of 1642 and 1643, it is not possible to verify Kajmash's statements, uh, nor if Lorosa wrongfully calculated them or just copied the ones included in the ephemerides, because um, they did not survive. Uh, we only, uh, apparently, um, according to Lorosa, he had started his business in 1637, but the um, the earlier almanac that we have today is the 1644. And um, Kajmash refers some things 
to the previous ones, but we don't we do not know if they are true. Um, we just have to believe in his criticism. As I already mentioned, the mathematical problem arises with the decisive horoscope for the entry of the sun into Harry's. However, unlike Kashmash, who declared that La Rosa had cal calculated the horoscope for the meridian of Rome, I reiterate that it is more likely, if not obvious, that La Rosa did not make the computations at all. I'm, I'm referring to the 1644 almanac because I was, I'm going to show um, uh, later. Uh, I was uh, comparing uh, La Rosa's um, description of the, um, of the sun's entry into Harris for this year and, and comparing to, to a chart by Argolis. And um, they, they are quite similar. And it doesn't seem that they make the adjustment for the Lisbon meridian. By comparing La Rosa's data to Ergolis of Merits, it, became, it becomes clear that the author did not make the necessary adjustments for the different longitude, despite having mentioned, done, I mean, having mentioned doing so, as he presents the same time as Italian scholar for the city of Rome. I believe that the mistakes he made in judging, in judging it are the result of his lack of skills to interpret it. The premise that it was a lapse, or even that he could have mistakenly calculated it for a different city other than Lisbon, as Kashmash claimed he had done before, is discarded because it presents the, same, the exact same time as Argoli. As La Rosa seems to have made this kind of mistake more than once, it appears to be, to be indicative of bad practice. So Kashmash denounced La Rosa for missing, ba missing basic rules, but also for copying judgments by other authors, but still failing to make the required corrections when uh, they were of his own authorship. I did not mention, but uh, the almanacs for 1637, 38, and 39, uh, we, we don't have access to them, but Kashmash says that he copied literally every word from um, Sequeira from Tesouro dos Prudentes, but almanacs for uh, other, other years. So it seems that he just basically copied entire texts, but that did not match the horoscopes for these years, because I believe it was Sequeira's charts were for the beginning of the century, I think, like 20, 30 years before. And Kashmash said, um, he accused him of copying from Tesor dos Prudentes, these almanacs, and quote, in the others, the more he deviated, the greater was his error, end of quote. In general, Kashmash criticized La Rosa for selling almanacs, which he considered to be mere copies of other authors' works and for hurrying when they were of his own authorship. His lack of knowledge and continual failure in studying the tradition, as well as his dishonesty, it seems, got in the way of a good work. In sum, Kashmash sought to follow Lorosa's work over the years, paying attention to his prognostications. After being called to the debate with delegations regarding the Locust's manuscript, he used the example of Lorosa to draw attention to the discipline's malpractice. He particularly stressed the importance of correctly calculating the horoscope for the spring equinox, as it was crucial for deducing the circumstances of theory in general. However, as, been shown, as has been shown by Kashmash and is now being corroborated by this research, that is something that La Rosa would not be doing correctly, sometimes not at all. With examples taken from La Rosa's work, Kashmash strongly demonstrated the importance of mathematical precision in the discipline's endeavors and firmly defended, defended rigorousness. And undoubtedly, when it comes to calculate the 12 celestial houses, as Kashmash says, quote, any error, however small it may be, is worthy of half reprehension, as it may result in a huge deviation in the configuration and consequently in the conclusions drawn from it, which is why he criticized La Rosa so much. 
With the criticism pointed, pointed out by Kazmash, it is clear that the mathematical aspect was a clearly important part of the practice. Kazmash criticized some of Larosa's interpretations, just as Larosa also pointed, pointed out the presumption of Kazmash's writing, but the main focus was, was on the mathematics, which was the starting point crucial for a correct astrological analysis. At a time when astrology was being strongly questioned, the debates were based above all on the accuracy of the calculations. Since, since it was through the mathematical aspect of the discipline that practitioners could, could prove their scientific credibility in relation to other areas of knowledge. A special example of the importance attributed to mathematics in Kajmash's work is his allusion to Pedro Nunes. Sorry, the, here I show the importance of mathematical precision because the computation leads to the correct um, configuration of the horoscope and from the horoscope we draw the, the conclusions uh, regarding the, um, the ruling, ruling planets and all the data, the aspects between them and then there is the judgment. That's why the first part, the mathematical precision is so important. As I was saying, a special example of the importance attributed to mathematics in Kajmash's work is his allusion to Pedro Nunes, a leading mathematician who gained prominence beyond, beyond the Portuguese context. Although it may be considered a, a, somewhat, a somewhat hyperbolic statement, Kajmash wanted to claim that after Nunes, other authors would have followed in his footsteps, also producing works of excellence in the field of mathematics in Portugal. Taking, taking into account the work cited by Kajmash in Almanac Prototype and in Brachilogia, it is possible to deduce that his level of literacy would give him sufficient skills to make him extremely capable of judging such matters. Thus, despite this being his first works in the genre, his theoretical knowledge is visible in the way he applies the techniques when making the judgments. A significant distinction in Kajmash's writings lies in the transparency of his computations, as he made a point of mentioning the number of charts he had calculated and of including his line of thought regarding the main components of the configurations or even a specific matter he wished to emphasize. Examples of this are the judgment on the fate of Prince Duarte of Braganza, brother of King John IV, the correlation established between the king's nativity and the years 1640 and 1645, and a series of celestial events that would have led to the king's acclamation in 1640. Therefore, including more information intending to, to show the rationale beyond, be, behind the judgments, Kajmash kept the discourse accessible to all kinds of readers. Despite the occasional mention of astrological terms that would not be common knowledge, the underlying logic can be followed. This came to contrast with the majority of the writings that were being published, which revealed only the author's conclusions, suppressing the reasoning. I'm going to show an example of the um, of Larosa's um, description of the sun's entry into Aries for 1644, the, the chart that I was mentioning before. This is Argolis chart from the ephemeris, and this is Larosa's description. And I was, um, I was trying to, to see what, uh, what he have done here. And as you can see, by the time, he did not make the, judgment, the adjustment for Lisbon, because he presents the exact same time, 10.53 in the evening. And it's the same time as for um, as by Ergoli, and it, there should be at least a difference of two hours. <clears throat> uh, then, um, some, some criticism are by Kajmash. Uh, Kajmash said the Lord of the, the Year was not Jupiter, and um, in, this, in the 28 degrees of Aries, yet, uh, Lord said he had triplicity and term in the fifth house. I was, I was checking and there is no term here. 
so there, these are some examples of my of my checking. <laughs> and then here it, it, it mentions that the Lord of Toro, that um, that Toro is in the seven, which which confers. But then um, he mentions other things that do not seem to match to a single horoscope. Maybe this is too technical, but uh, uh, so I, I confirm that the Lord of the Second is in the angle of the fourth. But then, if he says that uh, Venus was in the seventh, it uh, it would not match with the ascendant. So there are some discrepancies here. So sometimes it seems that he forgot to refer a different time for Lisbon. Um, but then when I'm analyzing the chart, is some, some things are similar to Argoli, but other things are not. So it's, it seems like he's mixing two horoscopes at times. It's quite confusing to try to understand the text. Um, by reconstructing the figures and their analysis with contemporary software, it is possible to observe the same mistakes pointed out by Kashmash, as I referred, namely the incorrect ter attribution of the term of Jupiter and the formulation of a prognostic that does not correspond to a single horoscope. La Rosa presented some contradictions when judging the figures of the Sun entry into the sign of Harris for this year. Sorry, I'm mentioning this. Referring to the Lord of the first house as being in the fifth house conjunct to Venus, being Jupiter. That is, he is here. Um, and the Lord of the second on, on the angle of the fourth, which is Saturn, thus consistent with the Sagittarius ascendant. Here in Argoli, there is um, a Scorpio ascendant. Uh, but then he said the Lord of the seventh house was Venus which is here in the fifth house, but which will only be possible if the rising sign would have been Scorpio. So, like I said, sometimes it refers that the ascendant is Sagittarius, and other times it refers that it's Scorpio. So it, it does not match. Thus, it seems reasonable to draw one of three possible conclusions. First, whether, La or whether La Rosa overlapped two different figures or prognostics. Second, he copied the judgment made by someone else again. Or third, but less likely, he failed to understand Argoli's horoscope and to make the necessary judgments for an interpretation, namely applying the five degree rule whereby a planet positioned within five or less degrees from the cusp of the next house should be judged as pl being placed there. <coughs> In Almanac Prototipo, when analyzing what the year 1645 would bring for Portugal, Kashmash swayed the planets of the several horoscopes he had calculated to come up to Jupiter as Lord of the Year. Here we can see uh, the differences in the calculations. Kashmash calculated 12 charts. For, uh, here I present uh, three years, that, uh, four years, sorry, that are the years in which we have correspondence publicly be, uh, between them. And then I got uh, two other authors to compare for the year of 1646 to see what uh, the Almutam would be for them. Uh, but as we can see, Kashmash presents lots of calculations and this specifies a lot for each season and for the year in general. And uh, La Rosa mentions two planets the, the ruling one and an adjunct, but the others only mention a single planet. <coughs> um, actually, Sequeira in his almanac only says that Venus is Lady of the Year because it is the strongest, strongest planet. It does not seem to have done any other waking. And Miranda says that spring will be very happy and pleasant because of Venus. So. That's just it. They present a, a short uh, phrase um, justifying the Lord of the Year. Uh, 
against Kajmash's texts. We, we see he's very, very thorough in his presentation, in his calculations, and also when dis describing um, the weighing of the planets. <coughs> so, according to, to Kajmash, in 1645, the Almutam, that is the Lord of the Year, would be Jupiter. And um, because it was a planet with more dignities in the charge as well. And uh, Jupiter is the great benefic and as a planet considered tempered and favor favorable, sorry, favorable to life. And then Kazmash naturally judged the year to be temperate, warmer than dry, healthy, and thus fecund of the supplies as well as in the propagation meaning there will be a very positive indication for the agriculture. He then added the prominence of the element water in important, in important key places as a strong indication of fertility. Venus as one of the benefics as well in the sign of Pisces and two of the angles in watery signs as well. The western angle and the mid heaven, that is the seventh and the tenth house in Cancer and Scorpio respectively. Surprisingly, Kajmash also included the sixth house in this consideration. Um, I, I will quote, for being in the sixth house and western angle, the sign of Cancer, and Venus in the sign of Pisces, and being the culminating Scorpio, all fertile signs, and not hindering the places of the two luminaries and of Jupiter. End of quote. He refers to Jupiter for being ruler of the year and the moon and the sun for their importance as luminaries that are planets to, to, make, to make sense, to include. Um, Venus as well because it is connected to fertility and is, he considers it to be in the second house and then he, he makes a judgment on it. Uh, but the sixth house is not so obvious for, um, for this kind of interpretation of the year. Um, also, because he, he mentions cancer is in the, I don't have a chart, sorry. Uh, he mentions cancer is in the sixth house, but it's not the, the sign at the cusp. So, um, and uh, there, is place, there is Mars placed there, but it does not mention it. But uh, um, this is, does not seem to be in accordance with the tradition because uh, it just refers that cancer is inside the sixth house. And he uses that to, to say that uh, there is a fertile sign there, so it helps. But usually there are, there are mentions only to the angles and to important planets. But somehow Karmash would have talked that it would be a good influence. Uh, and this, this, the most difficult part of studying mundane astrology is there. there is no manual uh, to, to follow, and there are aphorisms and some rules, but uh, not a systematized compilation or method. So it becomes hard to follow what the, the astrologers were thinking, and uh, they mentioned some authors, but there is not... Um, really a manual that we could follow to, to see if they are thinking, thinking uh, correctly or not. Um, so Kajmash thinking is not so perceptible at times when it says um, this kind of considerations. Also due to the language of the 17th century and the fact that several of the steps of his thinking are naturally suppressed for being an almanac. When it, when it comes to the aspects, it points, on, it points out in order to make the analysis of the year in general, it seems that it considers both type of aspects in mundo, that is by house and by sign, and also by degree, uh, which is why it's so difficult to understand his reasoning. But it does not mention what kind of aspect he's considering, and sometimes he just, um, he just talks um, without punctuation, so, so at times, it's difficult to understand to which planet is is referring to, and sometimes um, this becomes even more difficult when the signification of the planets and the houses and the signs overlap. 
So it's like a big mixture, and I do not know to which one is um, referring. To. Um, here I have an example of um, th this is uh, Kashmash's um, horoscope for 1645. And I have a passage here that shows um, a judgment on the, on the Almutam, Jupiter. It says, Jup some, some of the nobility signified by Jupiter will suffer miseries, wounds, and captivity because they are in the decan of Saturn, which influence, influences such effects in the opposites. It will also excite the spirits of merchants and traders to renew their trade in very distant parts. Here he refers to merchants and traders, um, sorry, I forgot to continue, from which they will receive no small greed from shipping because Mercury is in a house and sign of water. So here he, may, he is referring to Mercury because it is a natural significator of commerce and for being in Pisces, a, a sign ruled by Jupiter was interpreted as denoting great enthusiasm by merchants to expand their business in foreign lands. Jupiter and Venus, rulers of this sign, the last by exaltation, will inflame the expectations and instill in the merchants the greed of trading overseas. Here I think Kajmash talks about greed because apart from Mercury being weak, which means it cannot accomplish much, the other two planets inflame it. Jupiter excites the spirits of the merchants and Venus, because it is exalted, promises more than it gives. However, Kajmash does not mention the aspect between the planets. The conjunction of Mercury and Venus, for example, uh, would actually give some support to the subject. Because it, it, it says, because it, in it, because it is in its fall and detriment, it, is, it also denotes great breaks in deals and losses of ships at sea to those subject to the sign in which it is, that is Pisces. For this interpretation, Kashmash was, was not clear as to whether he considered Mercury to be in the second or in the third house, as I referred before, which would add the themes of economy and resources, the second house, uh, or all types of communications and trade, respectively, for the third house. Uh, this one, it seems more obvious, but again, the third house uh, has some, um, some similarities to the signification of Mercury. They both signify um, communication, so Kajmash could be referring to either of them. And he says, in very, sorry, it says, in very distant parts, maybe because the watery sign along with Mercury would suggest commerce abroad, and abroad at this time would mean overseas, or just because the watery sign with the third house, house of traveling, although it usually means short journey, shorter journeys, would signify travel by navigation. However, because Mercury is very debilitated in this sign, in which it is in detriment and fall, uh, the author predicted major breaks and losses. Um, Pisces could mean uh, for Portugal, because um, Portugal is subject, um, is subject to Pisces. One of, it's one of the signs attributed to it. Uh, or uh, or uh, more specifically to some coastal towns, because it uh, is a water sign. But again, Kashmash did not mention. Um, when referring to Venus, um, uh, Kashmash placed it in the second house, which is curious because Venus is only a few minutes further away from the cusp than Mercury and, Pi and in Pisces as well. So here we see that Kashmash uh, does not consider uh, every time the five degree rule because Venus and Mercury are less than five degrees away from the cusp of the third house but uh, he considers them, uh, he considers Venus in the second, and Mercury seems to be considering in the third, even though they are conjunct. Uh, 
so Kashmash chose to make the judgment towards the second house regarding Venus. Uh, this kind of consideration leads to wondering if this, wa this was a decision in order to favor the planets and therefore make a more promising prediction towards the subject, in this case the country's resources, that according to this verdict would see great aument. The Ferrari mentions are the many great contentions, quarrels and disagreements caused by the opposition between Mars that should be here in the sixth house, but somebody forgot to put it in the horoscope, so it should be here um, at uh, one degree of Cancer uh, in opposition to the Moon, that is in the, se in the twelfth house. Um, and uh, he, he refers content because um, he, he doesn't mention why, he says Vin uh, um, he refers to the moon, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't refer, sorry, that the moon rules the seventh house. So it should add the themes of confrontations, perhaps, because the seventh house is the others, the enemies. Here is some, some other examples of the, um, of the judgment. It says that although being conjunct with Mercury in this detriment and fallen in Pisces, wet sign and the dragon still of the dragon in Aquarius, which spare, square aspect to Jupiter, Lord of the year. And it says it is contrary to the study of letters, because probably because Mercury is weak and is in a square aspect to Jupiter, the Lord of the year, so it's not a good uh, subject to, 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 um, sorry, to study, maybe. Uh, but here, the way Kashmash is right, right, uh, it is not clear whether he is referring Mercury or, um, sorry, or the tail of the dragon to be in, in the square aspect of Jupiter, because we can see here the the south node. Uh, if if he considers um, the degree, it is it is in exact square to Jupiter. And uh, if he is considering Ju uh, Mercury, he would be considering by house. So as it does not refer, I I I, I just uh, can guess that. Um, is referring by degree or by house, the, the square. Uh, sorry, and um, I forgot to mention, uh, that's why it's not so easy to, to ascertain that Kajmash would be using aspects by degree as well, because he never refers explicitly that. But it seems, especially because it's an exact square. Um, as I referred, mentioned, uh, as I, as I referred uh, earlier, um, one of the themes that Kajmash uh, um, really described was, were the celestial events that indicated the acclamation of the new king in 1740. It was a, um, an important subject at this time. And he referred uh, all of these events, the um, Strela Nova, the Comet of 1518, the conjunction, the new star and the comet, and also he referred the Egyptians' perfect representation of 1640 and, uh, sorry, 5,040, 5, <laughs> difficult number, sorry, 5,400, 5, thank you. That would correspond to 1640, so he uses everything he has to, to show how this year would uh, indicate uh, a very important uh, thing for, especially for, uh, for Portugal, Portugal, but uh, also for the, the Christians as well. Um, in this passage, Kajmash established a connection between the king's birth chart, about 
about which he revealed no information other than its rising sign in the years 1640 and 1645. Then he linked the new star that had appeared in 1522, 1572, sorry, the comet of 1580, the maximum conjunction of 1603, and the new star of 1604, relating everything with the restoration and what he regarded as a very auspicious future for Portugal. For 1640, Kazmash did not specify which horoscope he was referring to, whether it was the one for the spring equinox or that of the king's acclamation, only that this would have been the year to which all the indications would lead. Kazmash mentioned the effects that were still being felt from the comet of 1618 and those of the Great Conjunction of 1603, but again, he did not mention what those effects would be. Instead, he focused on the many factors that pointed to 1640. According to the sources, the first conjunction of the superior planets, Jupiter and Saturn, in an element was always perceived as marking a new period. The ones that would follow them every 20 years as part of a series of conjunctions in the same element would have an impact, an impact that would last for a long time. This one being in the fire sign of Sagittarius, it will signify power issues, new dynasties, new ideas and religions. Um, the great fire conjunctions of the, the previous thousand years, of which there are records, had always been in Leo. The one in 1603 was the first in a long time to occur in Sagittarius, which may have been the reason why astrologers placed so much importance to it, particularly for the fact that it was the same ra sign rising at the time of the king's acclamation. Adding, adding to the Egyptians' perfect representation of 1640 and 54. Hundred, that would correspond to 1640, with their ends, all of this would be for the author an indication of the restoration. But above all, it would be a token of Christ's misericord towards Portugal, who would establish his empire in it, so that by this means of his, the whole world would come to receive the Catholic faith. This last part, mentioning Christ, appears to be an allusion to, an allusion to the work missionaries were engaging in, in overseas. In sum, the consideration of 1640 as the year in which all things would fall into place is related to the Sagittarius Ascendant and the acclamation chart. Uh, that was the sign the, in which the conjunction had occurred years before. However, it is interesting to note that we did not know if this moment was chosen by the court astrologer at the time or if it had happened to be a coincidence. Um, then, in a very interesting passage of Almanac Prototipo, uh, similar to the previous connection, Kashmash established a correlation between the horoscope for the acclamation of King João IV and the horoscope for the year 1645, suggesting that, simul that similar and even complementary events could be observed. Observing identical features in both horoscopes, the author then drew, drew similar conclusions regarding what the year might hold. To this end, he showed connections concerning the Lord of the Year, the Almutum, but also an aspect between the two superior planets as well as the position of the fixed stars in both charts. <coughs> Here in this passage, Sorry. We can see uh, as Kashmash is referring to, um, to the aspect of um, Jupiter and Saturn in both charts, but in, in the four elements. So in 1640, the aspect is between an air and a fire sign, and five years later, it's between an earth and, and water sign. So it, it, it says that they are complementary to each other, and 1645 <laughs> is like the conclusion of what had started in 1640. <clears throat> then, in Brachilogia, as you may have noticed, I focused a lot on the first almanac because it was the more extensive and comprehensive. 
And uh, regarding this, this second almanac, I'm just going to refer the judgment on the prince's release, uh, Prince Duarte of Braganza, um, that um, in the previous almanac, um, Kajmash had said that he was going to be released from uh, captivity, but then he, he realizes he was not released, and then in the second almanac, he retracts himself. So it's, he says, it, sorry. It, it, re, it remained to manifest who was the person to whom we promised freedom. It is not that I contradict it, nor for the moment manifest what can be conjectured in this part. I only say that the brothers of the kings more properly are in the figures of the years, signifier, signified by the twelfth house, as with most astrologers, affirms Guido Bonato. He had, he had mentioned it was the third house because it's usually in a, in a natal chart is the house of the siblings, but uh, in, a, in, a, um, um, in mundane astrology you should consider the tenth house uh, of the king and then the third of the ten, the sibling of the king. So it goes to the twelfth house, not the third as he had considered before. Uh, and here I show um, Prince Duarte of Braganza and um, what uh, Kajmash um, had considered before. So he said, because Jupiter in the, is in the Almugea of the Sun, which is in the third house, Almugea is, the, um, is when we count the signs and uh, the, a planet is the same number of signs away from the Sun or for the, from the Moon that uh, they will be in their domicile signs. Um, so it, it's yet said, it promises happy success, success to the freedom of the person that the third house signifies. And he thought it would be Prince Duarte of Braganza. Um, I, this is a reproduction of a chart because um, Kajmash did not present this chart. And, but this chart, uh, included in the 1645 Almanac, it, it was, this was a judgment based on the horoscope for the 1644 sun entry in Capricorn from the previous year. So it would not, um, it would not uh, be included in 1645 um, year, astrological year, but uh, because Kajmash uh, published the Almanac in the year before, he wanted to include a judgment for the first three months of the year, and he thought this would be, this chart would be a good indication for the prince. That's why he included this judgment. But uh, when I uh, when I try to reproduce what Kajmash might have seen, it, it's uh, again very difficult to understand because some things make sense. Other things, not quite so much, like specific things, like uh, where the antichi of a planet falls. It seems that um, it made some confusions sometimes. Uh, Is that? I'm extending myself, like Kashmash. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is very technical, I'm sorry. Uh, so, and uh, regarding that horoscope, I was confirming some, uh, some aspects, as you can see here. Some of them I've, I've confirmed as correct, some of them as not, to the, ch to the horoscope that he, that he was talking about. Some things were not possible. Some other things are uh, quite difficult to verify because sometimes he mentions something that you, he had seen in a table that we uh, don't have today, and I've checked all the tables. So I, I'm not sure if he was wrong or if he was seeing a different table. And uh, so in Brachilogia in 1646, he says that uh, actually he, he confirmed the horoscope he had uh, mentioned before, and the third house, was actually for, um, for a, an harsh bishop that was imprisoned um, in Treveris. So he said, I was wrong, it was not the, the king's brother, it was some other people. 
but he justified everything and he was very analytical uh, when justifying and um, he also did some um, some bold moves, bold astrological moves to justify this, this judgment. That I'm not going to extend, maybe, but it, it's quite interesting because Kashmash seems to, to be an astrologer with uh, lots of knowledge. And uh, he was actually quite clever when uh, judging the charts and uh, when making the correlations between the political uh, events of his time. Okay, thank you.